Good evening, amazing people. You look wonderful. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to the launch of the Greens 2019 Positive Plan Election Platform, of which we are immensely proud. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, of course it's the Ngunnawal people and the Gambri people in this broader Canberra region, and I'm looking forward to introducing our, our traditional owner who will formally welcome us to country. Um, but if I can just start off with a few formalities. Um, firstly, thank you for joining us. Secondly, please pop your phones on silent if you could. And also we have some um, support people in the audience tonight as part of our commitment to learn. ask you all to gather at the front, but actually everyone looks great just as you are. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be here with you. I'm um, one of our deputy leaders, Larissa Waters, down from Queensland. And we've just had the launch of our fantastic policy platform today. So Richard's going to tell us all about it this evening. And you'll also hear from two of our local candidates who I'm hoping will join us in Parliament after the 18th of May, Penny Keevers and Tim Hollow, um, who are just going to be And then once the formalities are concluded, we're going to head over to the road and um, have some nibbles and some chats. So, well done to everyone. I want to thank all of the volunteers who've organised tonight and thank all of our amazing Greens members and supporters who make our plan for a better future happen. Um, without further ado, I'd also like to introduce um, Uncle Wally Bell to formally welcome us to country. If we have um, Uncle Wally here with us. Oh yeah, hi. Um, I think some people might know me, um, but for those that don't, I'm a Nunawal man. Proper pronunciation, Nunawal. It's been um, pronounced incorrectly a lot. I have a lot of the time, and it's totally spelled incorrectly anyway. But <laughs> that doesn't bother me, because <laughs> as Aboriginal people, we never had a written language anyway. That's just the. Uh, <coughs> English version of our language, I guess. But uh, anyway, um, I've lived on country all my life. Um, I grew up in a little place called Jerawa, uh, a little village. It's on the right way along with you, between Yass and Gunny. It's um, that, in that place that I learned about uh, being an Aboriginal person, and that was done through my father, and that was done through um, our traditional way. Because as young uh, kids, and we get taught all about uh, our cultural life, it's um, closely related to, I guess, the natural environment. Because uh, that's where we got all our natural um, materials to, to uh, you know, make tools and, and all our natural resources in relation to food and stuff like that. So, country is quite important to us, and that, that's why we talk about our connection with country. Um, and, and that's where we get all our culture and our belief from. Um, you know, like, like I said, my dad used to take me out on country and, and, and we could do it in those days. You know, it's pretty hard to do these days because there's so much uh, laws that get in the way. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, like I said, my dad, used to teach me all about bush, bush foods and bush tuckers and, and, and how, to, how to get uh, water and all, all the natural resources that are out there which were quite, quite abundant in, in, in my youth, uh, my you know, childhood, um, also my youth I guess. Uh, used to still use a, a lot of the, the um, animals and stuff um, <laughs> for food and things uh, because of the fact that, well, you know, I was away from there. He was only working on the railways. Um, it's the uh, the land itself that's so important to us, and, and that's that's why I'm I myself still do a lot of uh, cultural heritage work in relation to land management. Um, I'm on a lot of uh, committees, I guess, uh, in relation to those sort of things. 
I'm on the ACT's um, land care um, board. I'm a board member there to impart knowledge about cultural practice and things on country uh, and, that, and about relating to country. Um, there's thousands of things I do. Um, and uh, oh, well, I've only got something like 10 minutes, so I can't tell you anything. So, <laughs> so um, as I was saying, then, our, our culture and our customs and our belief all come from country. It, it's where we get um, all our customary laws and things like that as well. But the overriding factor is that we also have, and it's right across Australia, all Aboriginal groups do it, is we have our law, which is our LORE. Uh, and that, that's important to understand as well, because that's, that rules what we do as, as traditional custodians on country. Um, and one of those laws that we have to abide by is, is um, the welcome to country. And a lot of people don't know what a, 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 you know, a welcome to country really entails. It's uh, where we have to not only welcome, say, you guys on the country, but we also have to make sure that you're safe while you're in country. So that nothing happens to you while you're on rural country because then that reflects on us as, as the host peoples. And we don't want to get a bad reputation, so we've got to look after you while you're here. Now, that um, caring for you while you're on country is also um, making sure that country is safe as well. Because as uh, we've lived here for a long time, um, we have to depend on the natural resources that are out there, the natural environment, whatever Mother Nature can provide for us. So, we make sure that there's uh, no bad stuff out there. There's bad spirit that people don't know about. Now then, that protection that I'm talking about comes in two forms. The first form is uh, a physical, physical protection, which is uh, offered up by our, what we call our spirit of the land. Like I said, that's where we get all our belief systems from, so it's important that you understand that the spirit of the land is going to look after you while you're actually treading foot on country. The, um, the other side of that then is the spiritual protection, and that's where I was just touching on about the bad stuff that's out there. So our, that spiritual protection comes from our ancestral spirits, and that's the past generations that now reside in the land. Because our, our, our custom tells us that uh, we come from the land, we're here for a little while, and this time we look after the country, we care for country, and then we return to the land. So all our ancestral spirits from you know, thousands of generations are in the land. And they're the ones that are going to look after you in the spiritual sense. So to um, explain the spiritual part of it a little bit, is that everybody here has got their own personal auras and that's something you carry with you the whole way through your life. And I think that you know that at times that gets affected because you're, you, know, you feel sad or sick or whatever. That's the bad stuff that happens to it. So to make sure there's nothing there, because uh, bad spirit is something that's quite a sneaky little fella and he, he'll just latch on to your own personal auras and you don't know he's there until you feel you know, sick or sick or whatever. So we've got to make sure that that stuff ain't here because it's, it's going to not only affect you as people, but it's also going to, going to affect country as well. So we're looking after country and it's our primary aim is, is Aboriginal people to do that. So the, um, I need to then call upon those spirits to come and join us. And uh, the best way I can do that from um, my people is to make a bit of noise and ask those spirits to come and join us. Okay, make a bit of noise with these things. And hopefully the acoustics aren't too bad in here.
Um, I can feel that those spirits have now joined us. Um, primarily because, because as an Aboriginal man, I have a really strong connection with country because I work on country all the, all the time these days. You know, I've spent 20 years in a strong public service. Um, okay, so what, what's happening now then uh, is, is that the spirit of the land, like I said, is going to look after you in, in the physical sense. As you're actually treading foot on country, it's going to make sure you don't slip and fall and injure yourself. Because we don't want that to happen to you. Now the ancestral spirits are going around and looking at everybody in this room, checking out your auras. And if there's any bad stuff there, they grab hold of it. And they just point it off country, get rid of it. Um, the only downside there, I guess, is because we're throwing it off in the country, where's it going? <laughs> Over onto one of our neighbouring tribal groups, country. Um, how it got here in the first place, they could have tossed it here, you know. But, you know, that, that's the way we do things. But um, the spirits do ask that you do two things for us while you're here on country. The first one is to respect this place that you're in, look after it, care for it. The other thing they want you to do is also to respect and be kind and courteous to other people that you meet while you're in country. So if you do these couple of things for us, the spirits will then harmonise with your stay on the more country. So may the spirits be with you today, tomorrow, and for always. I'll uh, finish off um, with a few words in language. Uh, if you didn't know, this is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Um, as an as a Aboriginal and tribal group, we've lost our language through the past government practices and things like that. But um, the, the words I'm going to say are Dara Nuna, Dara Nunuwe, Nunuwe. This land is Nunuwe land. Welcome. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Uncle Wally, for having us on this beautiful ancient land of yours and for welcoming us and having those spirits keep us safe while we're on this land. Um, that message of, of care for people and care for climate is something that resonates deeply with us. So we thank you very much. And of course, um, we acknowledge that we have an awful lot of work to do as a, as a broader community to have genuine reconciliation and truth and justice and healing. And I'm really proud that our party is committed to working for sovereignties and treaty and for genuine um, agreement making and a voice in Parliament. That's something that um, our Senator Rachel Seward has been working long and hard on and um, yes, we, we pledge that commitment to you and to all of our First Nations people. And we've got a few other wonderful people in the audience tonight. I neglected to mention that we've got your wonderful local member of parliament, Shane Rattenbury. Stand up and give us a word. working members um, of Parliament and um, yeah we thank you for your many many years of service Shane we watch what you're doing with great interest particularly the recent introduction of a federal anti-corruption uh, body here in the ACT which we want to replicate at the Commonwealth level soon enough um, so thank you for spending this evening with us tonight um, we've also got some of our fantastic federal parliamentary colleagues here and I'm going to invite them up on stage in just a minute because we're going to run through um, some of the key points that we launched today as part of our positive plan for this nation um, that so desperately needs some positive vision and some compassion and some sustainability and some forward thinking. Um, so I might ask uh, Senator Janet Rice and Senator Rachel Seward to come and join me on stage. plan and really it boils down to caring for people and caring for the planet 
rather than caring for corporate profits of donors. I think that's it in an absolute nutshell. And uh, we've seen a fairly uninspiring campaign from the other parties this time around. Certainly the leaders' debate was, as Richard described it today, a complete snooze fest. I think most of us folk would agree with that. And really our role as the Greens is not only to work for uh, a safer and brighter future for all of us, but we, we see ourselves as the ideas factory of Parliament. And you'll see time and time again we raise a, a suggestion that's often come through from the community, from the experts. And it might take a few years um, of the other parties calling us crazy or, or laughing it off, but give it a couple of years and eventually they'll say it was their idea all along and then they'll implement a fairly poor version of it and we'll be there to try and strengthen it. You'll see that um, with a litany of examples, whether it's the Banking Royal Commission, whether it's a federal ICAC, um, <coughs> this is our role, is to generate those ideas, to push for them and to bring them to fruition. So that's why our, our policy platform is so important because we can see it happening. Already we've seen um, Labor pinch some of the ideas in there and we welcome that. That's why we're here. We want to see good policy implemented to help this nation go forward. Um, so let's give you some of the highlights of that policy platform. Now, I think we are going to start off with you, Janet. So let's welcome okay. Senator Janet Rice. Okay. Achievements actually, I think, over the last time years in Parliament has to keep has to be has, has to have kept climate on the agenda. We are in a climate crisis. This has got to be the climate election. We've seen over this last summer the taste of things to come with the massive fish kills in the, in the Murray Darling towns running out of water, the twenty five thousand flying foxes that fell out of the sky, one hot. Queensland afternoon and the bushfires where bushfires should not be in rainforest in Tasmania and in Queensland. And we know that we've got the capacity in Australia to be the world leaders in climate action with such huge renewable resources. We must and we can be getting out of coal. We know that we can transition out of coal and gas and oil both domestically and as and for exports. And we know that you are not serious about tackling climate change unless you're talking about coal. That's the big difference with what the Greens are presenting to the community in this election compared with the old parties. So we've got a strong and evidence-based plan for that rapid shift out of coal and gas and oil to a renewable energy economy. One that will replace coal with renewables, build a new clean energy export industry and create 180,000 jobs. So it's all laid out. Manifesto, which is just extraordinary in its breadth, talking about that rapid shift, the jobs, and tackling both transport and agriculture as well, particularly with transport, kick-starting the electric vehicle revolution, committing to 100% of all new vehicle passenger vehicles sold being electric vehicles by 2030. Now, we've got massive ambition here in the ACT. This can be replicated all across the country. It's only the Greens that have got that passion and commitment. Okay, so climate, obviously the biggest issue facing all of humankind and certainly something we're talking about a lot in this election. The other key thing you'll hear from us is cleaning up politics because people are fed up with feeling like democracy doesn't belong to them anymore and that their representatives actually don't represent them. They represent whoever took them out to lunch and gave them a whopping great donation. So cleaning up politics is something that we Greens are desperately committed to. And sadly, we've got a long way to go. We've seen $100 million in corporate donations given to both Labor and the Liberal <coughs> National Coalition since 2012. And it's no surprise that we have such shoddy climate policy when five million of that have gone to both of those big parties just in the last four years. These people are buying the outcomes that suit their own corporate prof profits, their own corporate bottom lines, and the community and the planet getting put last so it's not on so we've been campaigning strongly to clean up politics to get that federal anti-corruption body that Shane's worked so hard to get here in the ACT the Commonwealth's the last jurisdiction that doesn't have 
an anti-corruption body. Now, the other party said that's because they didn't need it, but uh, don't think anybody believes that that's the case. So that's step one, and I'm really proud that after 10 years of us working towards that outcome, we have finally managed to shift the political debate, and we saw First Labor and now even the Liberals say that, yes, they agree such a body is needed. We disagree on the details and how strong it will be, but the fact that we've gotten um, multi-partisan commitment to having an anti-corruption body is a real testament um, to the strength of all of you as our members pushing for improvement. So it's the first thing we're going to work on um, when we are all re-elected and when we add some new people to our team um, after May the 18th. The next thing is, of course, getting the influence of big money off our politics. I've already mentioned the sheer volume of corporate donations that have flowed in to the major parties' coffers. Well, it's some of those dirtiest and most influential industries, whether it be mining, uh, property developers, big pharma, uh, defence, alcohol, tobacco, gambling. Um, there's a list of those folk that we just don't think should be able to buy access and influence anymore at all. And for everybody else, we think let's have a really low cap on the donations amount that's permitted of about $1,000 per year. Now, Big money shouldn't run politics. People should be allowed to commit, sure, but we think $1,000 is about the right amount where you can still have your say constitutionally, but you're actually not buying the sort of influence that, um, that big money buys in our current democracy. So we feel really strongly about that, and there's been some great progress made at state parliaments towards those kinds of strong limitations. We are hopeful that we'll be able to get that at the federal level. Um, and lastly, the influence of lobbyists. There is a revolving door between members of parliament and um, industry lobby groups. Whether it's as staff members, whether it's as politicians themselves, they leave parliament, they go to work for a representative body for the very industry that they were meant to regulate when they were in parliament. So we want to close that revolving door and we want to make sure that there is a ban of five years on going to work in an industry that you purported to regulate when you were in parliament. those rules about disclosing when you're a lobbyist and importantly we want to make sure that MPs and senators not just ministers actually tell the public who they're meeting with we think any meeting with a for-profit lobbyist should be should be publicly um, notified each month with diary records so we want to bring some sunlight in and we want to kick out big money and bring people on the planet back in as the drivers of our decision making so very excited about that agenda and for our next exciting instalment of our positive plan, I'll hand over to Senator Rachel Seward. So the next part of our very exciting plan is world-class public education, health and social services. We should all have access to high quality health care, education, affordable housing and uh, social services. A key part of a strong and vibrant community is a strong social security and social safety net to look after us when we are sick, when we're out of work and as we age. More and more people across our community are stressed and struggling to make ends meet and I'm sure you're all aware of that. We will make big corporations pay for their, their share of tax and put that money directly into funding public services that ensure everybody has a decent life, including a $75 increase to New Start and Youth Allowance. <laughs> and provide free TAFE and uni. Let's get our TAFE system back to what it used to be, providing quality services and education. Let's make sure the kids of the future are able to access free uni the same way I did and many of you in our audience did. Yeah. 
aged care services ensure that there is an aged care workforce fit that, that can do, deliver the sorts of aged care services that we expect for our older Australians. And let's ensure that everybody, everybody has affordable and secure housing. And use as the health issue, it is not a law and order yes. issue. Okay, on the public ownership, not privatisation, because privatisation has failed it. It's led to huge profits for big corporation, but less reliable services and increased costs for the rest of us. The Greens believe that electricity, banking and the internet should be run as essential services putting public good before corporate profit. We are the party of public ownership. We will create publicly owned energy and banking providers and stop Labor and Liberal governments from further privatising our essential services, including more of our electricity grid and the NBN. It has failed us so far, doing more of the same is just going to send us further and further down the wrong path. So our plan for publicly owned electricity, banking and the internet, we would create a not-for-profit energy retailer to kick off the transition for renewable energy and it would make sure we'd be keeping those electricity prices down for, for all Australians. We would cap power prices and buy back essential electricity infrastructure so that we manage in the public interest, not what's in the interest of the big corporations. We would create a not-for-profit bank to end the rocks and to bring down prices. The banking rock commission has shown the corruption in the system and bringing back a not-for-profit profit bank would mean that we would be able to have banking that we know was free of those rocks. We would break up the big banks and cap executive pay and we would oppose the sell-off of the NBN and upgrade the network to the best technology available for fast and reliable services. And of course, we need to protect our environment. You'll all be aware that Australia is one of the most biologically diverse places on our planet and it's also one of the most beautiful. Our environment is under threat as never before, from the Great Barrier Reef, which as we know, has a death sentence hanging over it if we don't take urgent action. The Murray-Darling is on the brink of collapse. Mm -hmm. We risk losing other world heritage areas such as Shark Bay in my home state of Western Australia and our farmers are suffering through more and more intense droughts, all as a result of climate change. <laughs> For decades, the Liberal and, La Liberal and Labor governments have let corporations get away with basically trashing this country and our planet for private profit. From the Franklin to the Kimberley, we the Greens have always worked to defend and protect our environment. This is why we need Greens in Parliament, to keep up this work. Yeah. A plan to protect our environment and everything that depends on it includes an, over, an overhaul of our environmental laws long past time that that is needed. the waste crisis to make Australia a global leader in reusing and recycling products. Yeah. Looking after... Sorry? Go ahead. <laughs> Looking after our oceans, our forests, our rivers and our reefs by improving our network of marine parks, ending deforestation, saving the Great Barrier Reef, protecting the Murray-Darling Basin, and stopping oil and gas exploration in the great Australian pot. Not only do our wildlife need homes, but so do our people, and we have a massive problem with homelessness in this country. Housing has been treated like a commodity, um, not a basic human right. So we want to change all of that, 
and we've got some fabulous plans that will work towards ending homelessness and making sure that young people can actually get into the housing market and the people who are in the rental market are able to have stable, good quality homes and can own a pet. So our reforms are a real investment in social and community housing. There are waiting lists that are far, far too long. So we want to see government invest to build half a million good quality, rent controlled social and community homes right across the nation. more rights to renters to make sure that um, uh, rent costs aren't just unfairly raised without good reason and good notice. We want those rent caps. We want to make sure that people have um, lease stability and we want to make sure that they can um, have a pet at home with them because we know the benefits that that, that brings. Um, probably the key thing is that we want to change the tax settings that at the moment make it easier for you to buy your fifth house than for someone to buy their first house. And so we are unashamed, unashamedly, we are driving that agenda. <laughs> and it's been very good to see some of the other parties pick up some of our policy, but we're really proud that we have been advocating to phase out negative gearing and to phase out that capital gains tax, those unfair tax perks, um, phase that out over five years to make sure that housing isn't treated like a commodity and a, and a thing to invest in, but is treated as a right for all of us to have a home. Uh, we're really proud of that and we look forward to delivering on that in the next term of Parliament. Jobs. Having a job. It's something that everyone should be able to have and have meaningful and secure work so that people don't have to struggle to make ends meet and so that people have then got the freedom to do more of the things that we love. I mean, some of us are stuck working far too many hours, many of us can't find enough work, and then there's the awful the scourge of casualisation, that jobs are just far less secure, which means you just can't rely upon you know, how much work you're going to have, what you're going to be paid, what your hours are going to be. It sends people's lives into complete chaos just to be earning the dollars to stay alive. And we've got wages flatlining. And small businesses getting squeezed by big businesses and their mates in the government. We know that employment in Australia is changing rapidly as well and there's just not enough to be done to taking account of that and saying what is employment going to look like into the future? What is the future of work? I mean advances in technology could be making everyone's lives better but instead we're in a situation now where economic inequality in Australia is the highest it's been for 70 years. So if we keep on going down the path that we're going, it's only going to get worse. Totally the wrong direction from what we should be heading in. So the Greens, we've got a plan to educate, to upskill and to invest in local communities as our industries change. We will protect workers' rights, we will support small businesses and the industries of the future. We will create jobs. So much of what we are talking about in this plan is going to create massive amounts of jobs. We'll close the gender pay gap and we will plan for the future of work. So our plan would increase wages and protect workers' rights by rewriting our workplace laws so that they are fairer for workers. <laughs> we would set up the Future of Work Commission to plan for the future and make sure that the employment of the future is fair, is just, is equitable, is in the interests of people rather than the interests of big corporations. We would invest in science, in research and innovation. The absolute future of our country depends upon that. And we would close the gender pay gap and better support working parents. <laughs> includes a fairer, more equal community. All of us deserve to feel safe and to have equal opportunities in life, no matter our background, our ability, our gender, our sexuality, income or postcode. We Greens recognise this always was and it always will be Aboriginal land and that sovereignty was never seen. deal of unfinished business in this country that we as Greens are totally committed to addressing. It's, it's long past time that we 
we had treaties, and I say treaties specifically, that we had healing, justice and truth for our First Nations peoples. To ensure a safe and equal world, we can't let a few powerful voices turn us against each other or divide us as based on, based on where we come from, who we love and what we look like. Both Labor and Labor, sorry, Labor and Labor, Labor and Liberal governments, the Laureals, have cynically pitted members of our community against each other. The Greens will always advocate for people's rights, champion diversity and call out discrimination. We'll call that bias and we'll call that bigotry. We will make sure that everybody has an opportunity to lead a good life free from discrimination. So that's why our plan includes working with First Nations peoples to establish a path towards sovereignty and treaties and ensure a voice to Parliament of First Nations peoples and to close the gap. We will close offshore detention. For asylum for people seeking asylum and who are seeking our help. We will champion diversity in our communities and stamp out systemic racism and hate speech. We'll ensure equality for women in all aspects of our society, including of the workplace. Yeah. We, will, we will make Australia accessible and fully fund the NDIS. Yay. that LGBTIQ plus people have full equality under the law and in our communities. Yeah. We'll create a charter of rights. We need to keep working on this. And we'll work to make Australia a good global citizen by supporting peace and demilitarisation. Platform, and I think the most exciting thing about it is we don't lack the financial means to have these things. We simply lack the political will. And that's why we go to great pains to say how we would pay for our commitments and our promises and our vision for this nation. And it's a very exciting um, revenue raising platform and I'm going to run you through some of the details of it now. But the key point is um, we need an economy that works for us. Yeah. We're all working longer, we're not getting any wealthier, the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider. So we need to actually fix that and part of the way we can do that in essence is to make big corporations pay their fair share. We've got one in three big companies one in three. So we have a massive tax avoidance problem in this nation and that is one of the solutions that we would bring in. Let's close that tax loophole to make sure that these big corporates aren't dodging <coughs> paying for what is ultimately our schools, our hospitals and our clean energy investments. There's also been about $65 billion of tax cuts that were promised by this current government in um, tax cuts for big corporations. Now, last time I checked, they really don't need the help. Yeah. In fact, we have an awful lot of ordinary people that are struggling and can do with that help um, and can do with those services. So we want to axe those tax cuts to the very wealthy um, large corporations that simply don't need the help. Yeah. We've got pretty much a corporate welfare industry here because as folk in the audience would know, we give out billions in tax freebies, often to fossil fuel companies that then go on to um, wreck the planet for all of us by, by digging up and shipping out and burning our coal. Fossil fuel subsidies are one of the biggest larks going and we would completely axe that cheap diesel and accelerated depreciation that those big mining companies get to do us the favour of making our planet unlivable. So what a great <laughs> We also put a super profits tax on oil and gas 
and coal, those mining giants, because at the moment they are reaping enormous private profits and in the process they are damaging the future of life on this planet. So let's tax the hell out of them while they're still around. <laughs> We would make big corporations pay for their pollution rather than the taxpayer paying them. So bringing back a carbon price is one of the central um, themes of our revenue raising. It's also obviously part of our really strong climate platform. We can have the things that we all need to live a good life. We can invest in the services that we all rely upon. That's what Australians deserve from their government. But instead we've had governments that dish out handouts to the big end of town because those same corporate mates give donations back to those political parties to keep them in power. The system's been rigged for far too long and we want to clean it up. So I'm so thrilled at the strength and the boldness of our platform. Um, and I want to thank Janet and Rachel for running us through um, the really exciting facets of that. It's now my great pleasure to firstly acknowledge um, Caroline Coutier in the audience who I overlooked before. <laughs> So thank you for continuing to do that. Um, but it's now my great pleasure to introduce a man who finds reserves of energy and positivity and determination that inspire us all, who embodies our values and who did us all so incredibly proud today at the National Press Club. Do yourself a favour if you missed out on watching it today. Go back on iView um, and make yourself a cup of tea or a glass of wine and watch Richard <laughs> blow apart this current rig system and give us all some hope and some vision for how politics should be done. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to me. respects to elders past and present. So I think Uncle Wally might have left us, but uh, I want to thank him for that uh, beautiful welcome uh, to country. And also acknowledge that we stand here on stolen land. This land was stolen, sovereignty was never ceded, and we have unfinished business. Um, let me also acknowledge uh, our wonderful uh, Greens MPs here in, uh, in the ACT. I want to acknowledge Carolyn and Shane. I got asked a question today at the Press Club uh, about Greens in government. And I should have said we actually already have Greens in government and they're delivering. Uh, so good on you for all the great work that you're doing. Um, I've got the privilege of working with amazing people and our team of MPs in Canberra are doing incredible work. They're hardworking, committed, passionate. They're just incredibly decent human beings and I've got the great privilege to work with them. So I want to give them all a huge round of applause. <laughs> definitely vote for that. Um, you know, politics got to give you something to believe in. And people are crying out for leadership. They want a genuine alternative to politics as usual. And that's what we're delivering here today. An inspiring vision that people can believe in for a more decent country, a more compassionate Australia, a more sustainable Australia. And I was, I was incredibly proud today to stand up and talk about those things that drive all of us, all of you, the reason you're here, to stand up and to tell the country, this is who we are, this is what we believe in. And you know what the good news is? Over one and a half million people voted for us at the last election because they share our values. They believe in these things too. They want people who support us because they want, and millions more, by the way, who also support us, and are probably Greens voters, they just don't know it yet. <laughs> we are a party that thinks about the future, that cares for people, and fights for the environment. And you know, when you look at our plan and what we've delivered for people in the last term of Parliament, we heard a long list of achievements, and it's important to reflect on those things and remind people about all the good things we have achieved. Do you remember when marriage equality was a fringe issue and you know you Greens need to focus on what's important? Remember that? Well this parliament delivered marriage equality because of the work of the Greens working with the community. 
and bringing it from the community into the parliament, now we have marriage equality in law. Forgive me if I repeat myself for you, but I walked into Malcolm Turnbull's office uh, soon after he got the job and said, we want a national anti-corruption watchdog in here. I said, we said we were dreaming, it's not going to happen. It's what? It's now Liberal Party policy, it's Labor Party policy, and we're going to have one. Our job is to make sure there is one. Party room and said, look, we need a Royal Commission into the banking and finance sector. It's rotten. We put motion after motion, was voted down, and ultimately, through the sheer force of pressure, we got a Royal Commission into the banking and finance sector. Jordan Steeljock almost single-handedly got a Royal Commission into the disability sector. <laughs> We've got $100 million for land care through the course of the last parliament. We actually changed the debate around drugs and shifted it from a law and order issue to a health issue. We started to see people get access to medicinal cannabis, a lot more that we need to do there. But it was the Greens who put that again on the agenda. And going into this parliament, we've got a positive plan that challenges the status quo, that recognises what the big challenges for us are, front and centre is climate change. And as I said today, this is not a Labor or Liberal or Green issue. It's not about what Australia does versus what the rest of the world does. This is about our collective intelligence as human beings, all of us, connected with each other right across the world, knowing that if we don't act together to reduce emissions, then life on Earth as we know it is over. And we'll be handing over an unsafe and unstable climate to some of the younger people in our, in our audience tonight. And it'll be up to them to clean up the mess that gutless politicians have failed to tackle while we've had the chance. And we know why. They're totally beholden to the coal, oil and gas industry. You go and have a look at the boards of some of these companies. You go and have a look at the representative bodies. It's a who's who of Liberal, Labor and National Party MPs. It is rotten to the core. And that's what we have to clean up politics if we're going to clean up our environment. If we do those things, if we take on some of these big vested interests, I mean, we don't have a tax system. We've got a tax avoidance system in this country. $11 billion a year in tax avoidance. If we take on the tax avoidance that's going on, within the coal, oil and gas industry. If we make sure they actually start to contribute for taking our resources, if we end those massive corporate handouts, like the diesel fuel rebate, we can fund all of these things. I'm not going to buy this idea that, oh, well, it's a great idea, but we can't afford it. Nonsense. If we make the right choices, if we show some leadership, of course we can afford it. We can't afford not to. And, you know, this debate that we're hearing at the moment. Oh, well, what's the cost of your climate plan? Well, what's the cost of not acting? Twenty percent of global GDP by 2100. Twenty percent of global GDP if we don't do anything. The loss of 70,000 jobs on the Great Barrier Reef. The loss of the Murray-Darling Basin and all of the communities that it supports, that is the cost of not acting. And of course, if we embrace the transition, because it's coming whether we like it or not, our job is to plan for it. If we embrace that transition, 180,000 new jobs. Investment. <laughs> this is something we need to embrace and set ourselves up for the future. And that's what the Greens are doing a plan to tackle climate change, to protect our environment. We're living through a mass extinction crisis right now. This is the age of the Anthropocene, where the single biggest influence on our climate and on our environment are humans. It's up to us to turn this around. No one's going to do it for us. We've got 2,000 species 
on the brink of extinction. Many of them don't even have a threatened species plan. It's the, one that, the ones that do are barely funded. In Victoria, my home state, you know our animal emblem is the lead beater's possum. It's this tiny little thing that fits into your hand. It's the state's animal emblem and we're locking it to extinction. The Carnaby's cockatoo in WA, our Tassie devils, our koalas, all under threat. And as I said today, you lose these animals, you lose a part of us. This precious wilderness that supports us. It's our responsibility not just to protect it, but to restore it. And the good news again is if we do this, if we price pollution, over 12,000 jobs, real jobs, long-term jobs, well-paid jobs in protecting and nurturing and restoring a natural environment, the environment that sustains us. You know, the flip side of the environmental challenge that faces us is the problem of economic inequality and our plan is so inspiring. New start, increase it by $75 a week because no one should be forced to live on $40 a day. Providing, I said to some young student strikers today, when I was straight out of university, I went to the States as a holiday. And one of the things that stuck in my mind were people sleeping rough, pushing shopping, shopping trolleys around. That was 30 something years ago. And I remember saying to one of my friends, vividly, thank God we live in Australia, because we don't have that in Australia. And now we do, now we do. So we're gonna build 100,000, sorry, 500,000 new affordable homes. Public investment, public infrastructure. Because everyone's in the same place. We're going to fund our education system. We're not going to leave our young people with the burden of debt hanging over their heads when they get a degree. Free TAFE in university, because you know what? University is not just a benefit to young people, we all benefit from it. It's a public good. Yeah. We want our community to be educated, to be set up for the future. No out of pocket costs. <laughs> was introduced because people couldn't afford health care. That's why Medicare was introduced. Well, we're heading down the track of a US system where you've got private health insurance, you get one level of health care, but if you haven't got it, you get treated like a second-class citizen. Well, that's not what Medicare was intended to do. We want universal health care. We want to make sure that people aren't deterred from going to their doctor or filling a script or going and getting an MRI because they can't afford it. <coughs> Free, universal health care. That's what we want. <laughs> we can do all of those things. We can do all of those things. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. They told us we wouldn't have marriage equality. We got it. Don't let anyone tell you we can't have a Greens positive plan for this country. We can. And here in the ACT, you can help make it happen. You can help make it happen by electing some of the finest people that would ever grace the halls of our parliament. You've got a wonderful team of candidates here. There have been some big changes in the ACT. We've got the new seat of Canberra now. We could elect Tim Hollow. I've known Tim for about a decade now. I first met Tim because he was working with Christine, helping to uh, devise the climate package that was described as by the International Energy Agency as the world's best climate laws. It was Tim who helped to construct those laws. To write them. <laughs> I don't want to... Tim is somebody whose life transcends politics. He's a deep thinker. He's the executive director of the Green Institute. He's a wonderful musician. Um, he's a, a treasure, and we're glad to have him running for us and hopefully winning this seat and sending a rocket up both sides of politics because we've just won the first seat in the Our ACT Senate candidate, 
I think we're a bit of a dark horse in these two seats in Canberra. I'm not talking them up too much outside of the ACT, but I mean, Penny, who has been providing a lot of support to Jordan herself, a researcher, a digital rights activist, somebody who understands that space intimately, a games developer, brings a whole breadth of skills that don't exist within our parliament, and better still, if she wins, she knocks off Zensa Selja. <laughs> to come into Parliament and represent the views of his constituency when the marriage equality debate happened. He argued against the rights of Territorians to even debate voluntary assisted dying. He is the epitome of what is wrong with the modern Liberal Party. But we can knock him off here. We can knock him off. And let me tell you, the other dividend there is that could change the balance in the Senate after this election. Now, there are a range of possibilities in the Senate. We could end up with a, another big bunch of crossbenchers, Clive Palmer, Pauline Hanson, and who knows, Corey Bernardi. And Bill Shorten then has to decide whether he's going to satisfy them on climate change and so many other things to get legislation through, or whether he's going to talk to the Greens. But the one way of forcing him to talk to the Greens is by making sure we've got a strong Greens voice in the Senate from the ACT, because that could tip the balance over. So it's up to you, all of you, to do what you can to help us deliver up this bold, positive, progressive, forward-looking, inspiring plan for the country. And you do that by ensuring Tim Holloway is the next member for Canberra and Penny Keevers is the next senator from the ACT. <laughs> It's so fantastic to see lots of people here tonight. Um, I also start by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And to any other First Nations people we have in the room tonight. I recognise that they never ceded sovereignty over this land. And it's critically important as we campaign for election, as we campaign to seek the privilege of being among those who make the decisions about our common future, that we put at the heart of this, that we must heal the wounds, right the wrongs, and ensure that Aboriginal and Islander peoples have a voice that is heard and an active central role in making those decisions. So, as I sat at the National Press Club today at lunchtime listening to Richard's wonderful, inspiring speech, I have to tell you that I was swinging wildly between hope and despair and back again. It's something that I do a lot and I'm fairly sure that it's something that all of you do a lot too. But during Richard's powerful speech, it was particularly strong for me. Despair because the challenges that we face, as Richard set out, are so immense. We've triggered the beginning of the sixth great extinction in our planet's history. We're losing birds, insects, mammals, reptiles, faster than ever before, never to be seen again. We're allowing inequality to spiral out of control, giving tax cuts to the rich and tax exemptions to massive massively profitable corporations, while refusing to lift Newstart, 
and invest properly in public education. And we're pushing people away from democratic participation. All of which is contributing to the rise of hatred and division. My beloved grandmother, who had survived the Holocaust, before she died three years ago, had started to say that she was genuinely afraid. That the world was starting to feel again like it felt in the 1930s. And then, of course, there's the climate emergency. I remember first reading about climate change in 1992 during the Rio Earth Summit. I was still at high school. And as a kid who was growing up wanting to be David Attenborough, <laughs> I remember it turning me from someone who loved nature into a budding environmentalist. And by the end of my time at uni, I had become convinced that climate change was the defining issue of our era. That was 1999. I immediately started volunteering for environment NGOs. I did a Masters of Environmental Law. I started to work in the space for the Conservation Council, Greenpeace, the Greens and 350. And for 20 years now, climate change has been my number one focus. It's what keeps me awake at night and what gets me up in the morning. And it's why I am running for Parliament. Because... <laughs> ...that we're still fighting for this because we are running out of time and we absolutely must ensure that the next parliament is the one which puts us on the right track for urgent, serious climate action. And that brings me to hope. Hope, because as Richard articulated and as Larissa and Janet and, Sarah and, and Rachel articulated today, we have the solutions. We know what needs to be done. And we've known for years and years. But now we also have the momentum. I've never seen in 20 years of climate campaigning the level of concern and impatience in the community that we have right now. We have the incredible leadership of the school climate strikers. Yes. <laughs> Agenda, demanding that we act to give them a future. I have hope, but still in my head, my mind keeps telling me it's almost too late. Our politics isn't up to the task. Labor doesn't want to get off the fence. What we need is big change and fast. What we need is a political earthquake. And guess what? Here in Canberra, we can deliver a political earthquake. We can deliver a political earthquake by electing a Greens MP to represent the seat where our parliament meets, by replacing a hard right senator with a brilliant, forward thinking, passionate, and compassionate Penny Keepers. MPs and no Liberals from the Capital Territory to the Federal Parliament. We're <laughs> for a political earthquake that will send shockwaves around the country and around the world. We can do this. This is not a dream. This is numbers and this is conversations. We've knocked on well over 10,000 doors across Canberra in the last six months. We've letterboxed the whole electorate twice. We've held numerous stalls and public events and received far more media coverage than the other candidates combined. We've had thousands of conversations with people, making the case that electing Greens in Canberra is how we pull an incoming shortened government down off the fence and towards the policies that we need. And I can tell you, for those of you who haven't yet been out with us, the response has been tremendous. I've spoken with countless people who've told me that they voted Labor their entire lives, but now, 
facing up to the climate emergency and seeing Labor equivocate on a day and back fracking the NT, they will vote Greens. I've even, I've even spoken with Liberal voters who are angry with their party's inaction and impressed by the Greens candidates and will give us their vote this time. And so many times, so many times, I've knocked on a door or been standing at a stall and spoken with parents around my age, with young children by their side, who tell me that they're seriously considering voting Greens but aren't quite sure, and their kid pipes up, the kids who've joined the climate strikes, and said, Mum, Dad, this is my future we're talking about. Vote for the Greens, please. <laughs> this is our future we're talking about. A future for all of us. The Greens have a truly brilliant policy platform that Richard launched today. We will get corporate control out of politics and bring the people back in. We'll lift New Start $75 a week and end the nasty, punitive approach to welfare that pushes people to the brink and becomes a barrier to them finding their feet. We'll make undergrad and TAFE qualifications fee-free. We'll close offshore detention and bring refugees here. Yeah. To protecting our natural world, the natural world that we are part of and is our only home. And we will replace all of our coal-fired power stations with renewable energy by 2030 and phase out coal exports, support the workers through the transition and protect our forests for the carbon, for the habitat and for themselves. We won't achieve all of this in the next parliament. But by putting it on the agenda, we begin to make it possible. And we make it that much more possible by delivering the political earthquake we know we can deliver here in Canberra. We can win these seats. We will win these seats because we must win these seats. For the last 17 days, we have to pull out all the stops. If you haven't yet volunteered, please sign up today. If you have, thank you so much. Please sign up for another store today. <laughs> today. We have to act as though our children's lives depend on it because they do. Thank you, and let's go and do this. people here this evening. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you so much to our federal colleagues for choosing to launch the very important, amazing, fantastic, future-looking, positive plan here in the ACT. It means a lot to us to have your support. We are so close now um, and I know that we're all eager to get this election over and done with and get this awful government out of here. across the ACT at early voting just this week, with people out in droves to vote the government out as soon as they can. Unfortunately, that's not how early voting works. <laughs> We're still going to have to wait a couple more weeks, um, but we'll get there. And it's, it's so funny because I think Tim and I must be really in sync at this stage of the campaign because I've been thinking about hope a lot today as well, and I think it is also on the back of Richard's um, amazing speech and just sort of, you know, digging deep and also really feeling that hope is what I so often need and it's hard to, it's not always easy to find. Um, and, you know, things have been, they've been bad here, um, here in Australia and around the world as conservative governments have, you know, seized their death grip on, on our planet and on our people and they've tried to drag us backwards. 
And every time a Conservative government is elected, I feel somewhat like I just I have to hold my breath and brace myself for, for what's to come um, during those years. But the good news is that things are about to change. We're turning the ship around. We're taking back our future and the future of our young people. And our future is going to be bright, sunny and solar powered. <laughs> winning because for us winning is about a lot more so much more than election results it's about setting the agenda as our you know amazing team has done here today it's about providing the leadership that our country so sorely needs and so desperately are crying out for and we just don't get from the major parties and it's about giving voice and strength to our community to do the right thing for our planet and for all people and we're the only ones who are looking beyond the election cycle. We're the only ones that have not just a vision for the future, but actually have a plan of how to get there. Yeah. This is a climate election because of us, because of all of our hard work over so many years, <laughs> alongside amazing community and grassroots organisations uh, like Stop Adani and 350 and so many others. And the kids, oh my goodness, the kids. Uh, not gonna cry. Um, <laughs> you just have to listen to these amazing, inspirational young people that there is so much hope for our future. And I'm not saying that we can stop fighting because we still have a long way to go. <laughs> But I'm saying what we do is what we're doing is working. And that really gives me hope. And it gives me enough hope and energy to keep going. Because sometimes it's really quite hard to find that light in the darkness. And here in the ACT, we have a real opportunity. We have an opportunity to make history and get not just one, but two Greens elected to our federal parliament to join our amazing parliamentary team. First, we've got the brand new seat of Canberra, which the AEC so kindly drew uh, our lines around our very best green areas in Canberra. <laughs> you have to remember to write them a thank you note after you win. <laughs> and of course, we've got Tim Hollow, uh, who is already the king of the inner north. Um, <laughs> asking how we felt about it. Thank you, Games <laughs> <laughs> uh, And the Inner North remembers how awesome Tim is. <laughs> and we've been out there talking to the people of Canberra since last year. We were the first ones out there. We were organised. We knew how important this was. And we've been out there talking to them. And they have been telling us overwhelmingly that they want action on climate change. They want humane treatment of asylum seekers. They want to close the camps and to bring those people here immediately. <laughs> and of course, they want integrity in politics. So many people have lost faith in our democracy and our political system because of the sham that goes, up, goes on up on the hill. And in the ACT, in, the, in Canberra, there's no incumbent. It's a brand new seat, and we know that the people there share our values and our vision for the future. And they have the absolute best candidate in Tim Hollow that anyone could hope to have. <laughs> so closely represents the Canberra community in, and is embedded and integrated into that community, but he also amazingly represents the broader change that they want to see. And then there's the Senate. Uh, and yes, following the Games of Thrones and analogy, I am the mother of dragons. <laughs> and you are my dragons. <laughs> 
in the Senate, we have a real opportunity to kick out one of the worst of the Liberal Party. Yeah. One of the most hard right conservatives alongside Tony Abbott and Peter Dutton, that is, of course, Liberal Senator Zed Seselja. <laughs> And if there's one thing that really unites people of the ACT, it is their <laughs> dislike of <system. laughs> And as, as uh, Richard already said, Zed, who supported Peter Dutton to become Prime Minister last year, attempted to, who was in Moringa on the weekend supporting Peter, um, Tony Abbott's campaign instead of campaigning here in the ACT, which he really needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the more he's here, the less votes he gets. <laughs> Rights restored to legislate on voluntary assisted dying in our assembly. And the year before, he abstained from the marriage equality vote after, the, after promising that he would uphold the wishes of the electorate. Well, we have the highest yes vote in the country. And where was it? He's been consistently down 9 to 10 points in all the polling that we have done and that we've seen in the last year. People have had enough and they want better. Canberra deserves better. Everyone deserves better. <laughs> I've ne I never wanted to be a politician, I have to say. I've been an academic here at the ANU most recently, a small business owner and a mum. I've got two young children aged five and seven, and I constantly think about the world that we're creating for them and the problems that we're leaving for them to fix. So how could I not <laughs> rise up and fight for a better future for them and for all of us? tonight and to all of you who have helped out on the campaign so far. The end is in sight. We're so close to dumping this government and hopefully Zed along with it. We're almost there. But we could still really use your help. <laughs> We've got a couple more weekends of door knocking as well as early voting and of course the big day, election day. If you can help, please sign up with one of our amazing um, campaign team. I'm sure they'll be happy to, to take your details and get you signed up to do something. I also want to thank our amazing parliamentary team who are here tonight, the actual leaders of the country that we need. <laughs> Richard, Larissa, Rachel and Janet and of course the rest who aren't here tonight as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge their, their staff, um, I used to be one, <laughs> who I know work so hard and have worked really hard to bring forth this amazing positive plan that you've heard about tonight. Um, I'd also like to also acknowledge Caroline Lacuda who has been a personal inspiration and mentor to me. Um, I joined the 2016 campaign because I saw an amazing group of women who I really wanted to get behind and get elected. And we did get Caroline elected. <laughs> and with your help, Tim and I could be joining our amazing federal colleagues up on the hill soon. So thank you so much for coming along tonight. sheer inspiration belong in our parliament. They're not going to get there without you though. Okay, so there's 17 days to go. Who here has already volunteered on the campaign? Put your hands up. That's pretty good, but there's a few of you that haven't put your hand up, so fix that before you go tonight.
Can I ask the people who've got clipboards where people can sign up to help to come and put up their hands? All right, there's one dude. You're going to be very busy tonight. <laughs> I don't want you to leave here tonight without investing in delivering this future for all of us. We all want to see this happen, but we can't get there unless we hold and increase our numbers in the next parliament. I want to see Penny and Tim in that party room. I cannot wait for that day when they walk in those doors and when we've got a party room that is bursting at the seams with amazing people. And I think Richard's saying, yeah, me too. Yeah, I also want to stay in there also. <laughs> I'm really hopeful that we're going to have our best election yet, but as I said, it's not going to happen just with us working like stink. We need you to redouble your efforts. Please help us knock on those doors. Please put that cord flute on your fence with beautiful pictures of Penny and Tim on it. Please help us staff those stalls. Help us reach people. Help us make those phone calls. And if you don't have any time, please give us some money so we can get our message out there. We don't take that big corporate money, so we need your help, we need your time. Thank you very much for everything that you're going to do to put these two amazing people into Parliament. So come back up to the stage, the next member for Canberra, the next member of the ACT Senate. <laughs> Join us on stage. Andrew, where are you? Andrew, come up and join us on stage. Um, I'm going to ask Jonathan, I saw Jonathan in the audience before. Jonathan, being, Jonathan is our candidate for Bean. Where are you, Jonathan? Come up and join us. Oh, God, he left. Bad move. Bad Bean. <laughs> bean. We need a member for Bean. It's got to be a green Bean. Okay, yes. Can I ask Emma Davidson if she's here tonight, who's our support candidate? Oh, she's gone. All right, we have an amazing team of people and they are at an election forum where they are convincing more people to vote Green. Can I please ask Richard and Janet and Rach to come back up on stage. This is your team for the federal election. These are the people that we want representing our values in the parliament. Let's give them a business can I thank you all for your hope and your time and the work that you're going to put in in the next 17 days to help us get this positive vision into our parliament and these wonderful people that will do us so proud as they stand up in that red and that green chamber and give voice to all the things that we care so deeply about thank you so much for being here tonight we're going to officially conclude proceedings but we'd like to invite you to join us over the road at something called Badger and Co I'm sure it's fantastic. There's some, um, there's some nibbles and lots of conversation to be had. So please join us over the road at Badger and Co. And we will see you on the hustings and on election day and election eve. I want you all to be celebrating the election of these two people. Let's work for it and let's deliver that future for all of us. Thanks very much.